My name is Jose Gabriel Munoz, and I play the Puerto Rican Cuatro. Um, and it is used uh, mostly for folkloric music of Puerto Rico. I grew up listening to the music uh, in my household. My, my dad would always play the music. I was born in Puerto Rico. Um, and so that those roots of the music and the culture was always uh, in my family. And my dad would always play the music. So growing up, I was always listening to it. It was always basically a part of me. Uh, but when I was about 14 years old, uh, I saw someone play it in front of me for the first time. And it happened to be a, a young man at my same age, about 14, 13, 14 at the time. Um, and that's when it became palpable and real to me. Uh, up until then, it was listening to 8-tracks and cassettes, uh, uh, you know, the old guard of the music, as I would call it. Um, and so uh, many young people, as myself at the time, would in interpret that as just music for old people, music of my grandfathers, of my older uncles and such. It wasn't the, the here and now hip type music. Up until I, I watched this young man play uh, right in front of me, and it became alive to me. And from that moment on is where the interest grew. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the instrument itself? Yeah, um, the instrument comes from the, the lute family, um, as my understanding. Uh, the one, the particular one that I play is known as the modern cuatro, sort of evolved uh, in the 1800s, if I'm not mistaken, uh, mid-1800s more or less. Um, it, it called the cuatro, obviously, their number four in Spanish, it has four strings. The four string cuatro is still used today, although it has evolved. Um, due to preference of either a luthier or a cuatro player from Puerto Rico who might have been experimenting at the time and added strings to it. Um, it jumped from four to eight and now the ten, which is the one that I play. Um, and I, I fell in love with that ten string cuatro. Uh, a particular cuatro player who made the ten string cuatros very, uh, very famous um, was Ladislao Martinez. Um, through uh, a radio program in Puerto Rico uh, naming, uh, called Industrias Nativas. Um, and when Ladi, as he was known, um, first was first aired playing this instrument, this tension cuatro for the first time on the radio, the entire island got a taste of the evolution of the cuatro as we know it. Um, and the rest is history, basically. Um, and so it, the modern cuatro is the most popular of all the cuatros. Uh, in Puerto Rico, there is an orchestra of cuatro. You have the tenor, the alto, the, the baritone, and it's an entire orchestra. But the, the ten-string modern cuatro, the one I play, is the most popular. It's the one that is used um, up until today, uh, used for so many different styles and genres of music. Aside from, as I mentioned earlier, what it's mostly known for and utilized for, which is the folk music. What are the different genres of music that, it, that it's used in? Well, uh, starting with the main sole purpose of the cuatro as we know it or like to, to identify it as, um, it is the jibaro music, mountain music uh, of, of the campesino, right? Of the peasant of the mountains of Puerto Rico. Uh, it was used uh, to sing poetry, to sing of, you know, political issues or what have you, of love and such. Um, but as time has gone by, you, you come across known legend cuatro players of the old guard, such as a, a gentleman named Nieves, Nieves Quintero, who started adding jazz to it and started recording albums, you know, a lot with a lot of Latin jazz. Then you come across uh, a, a cuatro player uh, known as Joe Motoro, who was a living legend also, who became famous with uh, artists such as uh, Hector Lavoe, Willy Colon, Celia Cruz, and La Faña All-Stars in the 70s, where he utilized the cuatro only to play salsa music on it. Um, and so then you fast forward to modern times where you have um, cuatro players like uh, Alvin Medina. Alvin Medina is one of the uh, few, not the first, but one of the few um, that put out an entire album on the Puerto Rican cuatro, um, only classical music, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, Paganini, things like that. Um, and then you have cuatritas like uh, Christian Nieves. If you don't know Christian Nieves, Christian Nieves is the person responsible, is the cuatro player responsible uh, for the world famous melody of Despacito. All right, the beginning of Despacito, you hear a cuatro right at the intro. 
That's Christian Nieves. He's a good friend of mine. Um, but it shows how the cuatro has become so universal and has expanded to so many other genres and styles. Um, and there's so many other cuatristas that have uh, become a part of the community with, with taking the cuatro to different parts of the world through music. All right. Um, what, is, what is your preference for which genre it gets played in? Um, I'll be honest, I don't think any musician, I mean, if I, can, I can obviously speak for myself, but I don't, I don't know if any musician actually has a preference. I mean, as a musician, you, be, you receive so many influences. One day, I, you know, I just want to listen to classical and I'll, I'll riff something classical. There's another day where I'm in the mood for hip hop and I'll grab the cuatro and start jamming to that. There's another day where I'm in the mood for reggae. And I guess um, you learn, you live and learn from every culture, every genre, every style, and maybe you just adapt it to, to what, you know, you, you play, whatever instrument and culture you're from, and, and you try to apply it to that and, and evolve and grow as a musician so that I don't personally like to stay, you know, stuck in the same in the same place when it comes to my music, I try to expand and experiment uh, to keep maturing and growing and learning and educating myself and learning more disciplines uh, from other musicians and, and different styles. So I, yes, I have experimented with R&B, I have experimented with classical and a whole bunch of different genres. Um, just to continue proving that although it's a traditional folk instrument, it is not limited. It's, it can be worldwide just like any other instrument. You said that you were born in Puerto Rico? Yes. Yes, I was born in the, in the town of Utuado. Uh, Otuado is its indigenous name, uh, meaning between mountains. It's almost at the center of the island. Uh, I was born there, uh, but moved here to New Jersey at the age of, of about two or three years old. Uh, the, the first time I ever returned back to Puerto Rico, um, I was 10 years old. My, my parents uh, found it imperative that, that uh, I go back to meet my family and know where I came from and my roots and my culture. So that that influence also played a big part in me taking up the instrument. Um, how has the how has growing up in the states versus on the island been it, an impact, or how has that impacted your music and your education on that instrument that isn't played as much in New Jersey as it is in the mountains of Puerto Rico? Um, I feel personally that I would have benefited more growing up on the island. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, I feel growing up on the island, it would have benefited me more to be m more s surrounded more by other musicians uh, that play this instrument um, and, and are surrounded. There's so many cuatro players in Puerto Rico that are completely saturated by the music and the culture of, it, of the music of the cuatro 24-7. Uh, um, and so I felt growing up here, I was a bit, li a bit limited, especially around the early 90s when I started where, you know, YouTube wasn't as big and all these videos and internet access wasn't as big for, for things like this. Um, I, was, I felt a little bit limited in having to find out or seek out musicians to sit with and try to learn from. Whereas once I picked up the instrument and traveled to the island, I was completely surrounded by it instantly 24 7 at any given moment i could just hook up with any musician and just sit down and start going over stuff and 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 see how much they have to offer as musicians because again they're surrounded by it by the culture of it 24 7. how did you learn if you if you started learning pre-youtube era what was your your kind of how did you get into the beginning um well as as i mentioned uh i i saw this cuatro player, uh, Alvin Medina, he's, he's one, of the, one of the young greats. Uh, currently, Alvin Medina is touring with uh, Romeo Santos. He's Romeo Santos' uh, cuatro player and guitar player. But when uh, Alvin and I are the same age, when, when, when I was 14, I saw him playing somewhere. And it, it completely just took over me. The sound, his ability to play, his discipline, his talent. And it just so happened that my father and his father knew each other. They were friends. So uh, my dad said, I'll, I'll hook it up for you, for you to start taking you know, lessons. So Alvin lived only about 25 minutes from my, from my house. So every weekend, my dad would drop me off at, at his house. And I would take lessons 
uh, Friday to Sunday. And it, I religiously and, and with such discipline, my dad would just drop me off every Friday, pick me up every Sunday for an entire year or year and a half. Um, and it, it wasn't it wasn't that type of discipline where, um, you know, we were reading, writing music. It was just sit down and let's jam. And to this day, I still have some recordings of us at two or three in the morning at 16 years old, 15, 17 years old, just riffing and playing whatever comes to, to, to our, our minds and our hearts with music. And a lot of musicians learn that way. Um, unlike today, now there's so many more uh, opportunities and chances to learn uh, proper education discipline through schooling. Back then, it was just getting together and, and you know, like we call it, uh, street musicians, just jamming. And that's how I basically picked it up uh, through through Alvin. After that, it was a matter of once my eyes were open to this world of the music and its culture, it was just a matter of, of meeting other musicians and sitting down and learning. Um, is there... Is there... Is there a, a strong community of followers or, or, and or musicians that play this instrument here in New Jersey? In New Jersey, no. In New Jersey, I mean, I, I could possibly count on, on less than one hand or one hand musicians in New Jersey that actually play this instrument. Now, you go to the island and, and there are a dime a dozen, <laughs> literally. Uh, you, you could just throw a rock out the window and hit a cuadro player because it, it's... It has grown to such great lengths that, that I'm so proud to say um, this, that's something I've always wanted to see. Um, and so um, here in New Jersey and in the States, it's, it's scarce, it's very rare. I feel honored to be one of the very few in New Jersey, uh, you know, to be able to play the instrument and represent uh, Puerto Rico through the instrument and its culture. It's, it's a humbling honor. I always felt it's like a responsibility on my shoulders to represent the island here, and that's why I have... Uh, kind of discipline myself and I've always pushed myself extra hard to try to learn as much as I can on it um, to be able to, to make you know Puerto Rico proud and my people proud here in New Jersey and in the States of representing our culture through the music. I wish there were more though because as a musician we always like to get together and, and continue to learn and grow and as I said it, it, it was always a kind of a challenge to be able to, to continue learning. Uh, without being surrounded by it 24-7 and having to, to seek out musicians and seek out stuff. Thank God now we have you know, the World Wide Web and, and you, such things such as YouTube and such where you could just press a button and boom, there's someone playing there. Uh, but back then we didn't have that, so it was a little bit more challenging. Um, and, and so I hope to be able to influence um, younger generations of cuatro players um, so that, um, you know, I leave some type of legacy where here, at least in New Jersey, there's, there's, it'll continue to, 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 to strive. And how is, how is the, the instrument and the genres of music that you play, how is that um, received here? Um, thankfully, it is, it is well received. It, it is well received because of the fact that it's rare. So when Puerto Ricans who are so proud, I mean, Puerto Ricans, I noticed, they reverence that instrument. It is the national instrument of Puerto Rico. Um, so, so people such as myself, I, we reverence that thing. We see that thing, and I just want to kneel down before it because it is the national, it represents such, it represents so much. When you see an ensemble of, of, of Hibaro, right, an ensemble of the typical folkloric band, you'll have typically, traditionally, you'll have a, a guitar, a cuadro, a guido scratch gourd and, and a set of bongos, sometimes a conga is added and a set of bongos and then you have the singer and so the, the guitar to me represents the influence from Spain, right? Then you have the bongos and, and, the, and the congas for example represent to me the influence that we got from our African ancestors, right? Then you have the guido that represents our indigenous side, right? The scratch gourd that comes from our indigenous, as we know, our Taino ancestors. But where does a cuatro fit in? You know, the cuatro is like, okay, we don't know exactly, we, we have an idea, we have a concept, but it's not really from either, it's just a, a mixture. So it, it's, it's so awesome to say that the cuatro, although we know it comes from a, a European type influence through the Lu family, it is 100% born in Borinquen. It is 100% ours from Puerto Rico. And it's something that we, we cherish, we worship, we love. Um, and so I, I notice anytime I perform with this instrument, 
I've seen people cry, I've seen people laugh, I've seen people come up to me after performances you know, in tears because it reminded them of the old island, they haven't been back in 20, 30, 40 years. It reminds them of their grandfather, their uncle, and, and I can't express, I really can't put in the words how that would make me feel. It does put more pressure on me, I have to say, but it's pressure that I embrace, that I use, and I transform into the energy that I need to, to be a better musician. Um. Have you faced any challenges in practicing a foreign tradition here? Um, as, as far as challenges are concerned, um, I, I have faced a few, specifically just on um, better, better learning and expanding as a musician because of, of the lack thereof of other musicians in the area and such. Um, personally, other than, aside from that, uh, there hasn't been great challenges. I've learned to adapt growing up here in the States and growing up in New Jersey. I learned to adapt and I learned that this instrument is not limited. Yes, we have our, our traditions, our usual traditions that we honor and love, but it is not limited to that. Um, and, and throughout several, I would say the past 10 years, the Cuatro has grown and expanded throughout the world in, in such a way where it's being played all over Europe and other parts of the world, in Japan and, and things like that. Uh, even in Australia, in Germany, it's all over the world. Um, and so it kind of uh, makes it a little bit easier on me to, to, and I rest easy knowing that it's, it's already out there. Um, so although my responsibility still stands to take it as far as I can possibly take it, it's, it's kind of worldwide already. So I, I don't face uh, any challenges as far as, as trying to get it out there. Um, but personally more so uh, just trying to expand as a musician and trying to to meet more cuatro players because it's so rare especially here in the state of New Jersey and in the states uh, trying to seek out more musicians like-minded musicians uh, where we can learn from each other and grow why why is there a lack of interest in the cuatro here or you haven't seen that interest in the cuatro here in New Jersey well the cuatro is not an easy instrument to learn. I will admit it, it is not impossible, um, but a little a little difficult. Um, and so the the challenges the cuatro itself uh, presents as an instrument sometimes intimidates people. And so um, we as cuatritas or cuatro players try to um, make it as simple as possible, as fun as possible for younger generations to learn. Um, so that we can be some type of influence. I, I continue to find that a little challenging um, trying to continue to pass it down because um, yes you get people that all of a sudden get bitten by the bug you know as we say and then w want to learn but once they get into it and they realize it's not as easy as playing guitar it's not just strumming. The cuatro is used for a lot of lead guitar style playing so um, that uh, you know kind of intimidates people because then people realize wait, I have to really put a lot of time into this. I really have to discipline myself. And it, it kind of intimidates people to want to have to put in the work. Um, you, have to, you have to be overcome, in my personal opinion, you would have to be overcome by the passion of the instrument and everything behind it and use that to push you. And that's what I feel happened to me. I, I wasn't just bitten by the bug. I mean, this instrument really just became an extension of my body when I first grabbed it in my hands and started learning. And I made sure I made it a point, if I was going to do anything else in my life, I was going to be a cuatro player. I don't want to just say, hey, he could play the cuatro a couple songs. I wanted to be known as a cuatrista. To have that kind of title, uh, responsibility comes with that. So in, in, in my younger years, I wanted, to make it a, I wanted to make that a point to become known as a cuatrista and recognized as a cuatrista. Maybe not one of the best. There's a lot of monsters and legends out there that I don't even get to their ankles, and, I, and I'm not afraid to say that. But at least to say that, you know, I put my little grain in there, and uh, I made a little bit of a difference where whether I can influence someone, then I was, I was content and happy with that. Now, you, you have obviously two jobs. You have your fake job, is that's the one that you go to every day, yeah. and your real job, which is that cuatro. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you see your future in terms of the cuatro 
being that cuatro, do you see it as something you want to do? I don't, you're already doing it professionally, but do you want to take it to the next level and just be able to make your living and your life the cuatro? Yeah, absolutely. At some point in my life, um, when I retire from my fake job, <laughs> I want to be able to really expand um, on the cuatro. I want to take it to levels and limits that has never been taken before. Meaning, I, I, the cuatro has always been, uh, its sole purpose is mostly 99.9% .9 of its purpose is to accompany, right? You accompany the trovador singer, uh, you accompany the band, your motoro, for example, you know, accompany the, the salsa band, or, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that. Um, but I would like, at least before my time in this world passes, I would love to see, and it doesn't have to be me personally, any cuatrita, any cuatro player in this, on this planet, I would love to see the cuatro uh, be the forefront. I would love to see the cuatro be the star of the show, be the lead, and, and, and in a way that it's never been done before. You see rock bands and the lead singers you know, up front on the microphone with the guitar, and, and I would like to see the cuatro doing that. You know, I, and this is, it's kind of a, a funny analogy, but I always use uh, for example, uh, this uh, Disney movie, Moana, when the movie came out, you saw every little kid lose their mind on this planet, one and rushing to the store to buy a ukulele. Everybody wanted to get a ukulele and learn how to play that beautiful music from Hawaii. And so uh, I would like the cuatro to have that type of influence, where you see so many young generations uh, fiending for it, wanting to learn because they fell in love with its, you know, the seduction of its melodies and its strings and its sound. Um, that's the kind of influence I want the cuatro to be. Um, if it's me, I'll do it. But uh, any cuadrita, I would, I would, I would die to see that happen. And and I'm gonna to try. I'm gonna try to make it my goal at some point in my life where uh, I can really invest 100% of my time into trying to make that happen with the with the cuadro. Um. Okay. So within. Within um, the world of cuatristas, do you find there to be any kind of um, levels of hierarchy, or is it music is music and everybody's kind of... Yeah, I, I have to admit, one of the greatest communities I have ever come across is the cuatro community. Um, cuatritas know, cuatritas know, you know, who they consider to be an actual cuatrita, a complete cuatro player. We know who has the real abilities, but no cuatrita is going to sit there and say, this guy's better than him, you're better than this, I'm better than you, you're better than me. Every cuatrita in the cuatro community that I personally experience has been more than willing and caring and considerate and loving enough to sit in front of you and say, hey, you want to learn this? This is how you do it, boom, 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 and just trade off music, and that's something I'm very proud to say uh, about the Cuatro community. Um, I have never really faced a challenge uh, in that sense. Um, I've been able to meet Cuatritas from all over the all over the country and all over Puerto Rico and such, and everyone's always willing to sit and share, um, and that's a great thing because that's how its legacy continues for generations to come. What makes a true Cuatrista? What makes a true cuatrita? Mm -hmm. That's a tough and deep question. Um, I would I would say when you see the passion in that person for the culture of its music, that what makes that's what makes a true cuatrista, because that passion will drive that musician to that person's last dying breath of wanting to upkeep its culture, its tradition, its 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 influence in the world. Not necessarily a, a cuatrita because he plays this genre, that genre, this genre, that genre. There are cuatritas that are long gone now, such as Ladi. Ladi was from the early 1900s, right? No one really knew who he was until like the, what, the 1950s, more or less, when he came out on the radio for the first time. This is way before uh, reggaeton. This is way before all these other styles of music. And to this very day, in the year 2019 that we're in, Ladi is still one of the biggest influences on cuatritas. He sat and composed boleros, guarachas, joropos, mazurcas, 
Uh, these are all traditional styles of, of Puerto Rican music on the cuatro. And to this day, he's still in So I feel it's just that, that uh, to answer your question, it's just that passion that Ladi had to influence everyone else around him. Maso Rivera died uh, of old age natural causes and never charged a single cent for a cuatro lesson. Okay, he would sit and, and teach for free. He never, he never referred to his, 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 the kids he was teaching as students, he referred to them as disciples. And, and that's such a deep meaning. And that to me is a complete cuadrita. Um, what is the, the impact of gender in the, in the world of cuatro playing? Is there, is there, do you see any disparities or bias in terms of who can play? Um, or, or has that been historical and is changing? What is your experience? With I that? believe it has been changing uh, back in the day, in the time of, like what I just said, Maso Rivera Ladi. Ramito, one of the world's greatest uh, Trovador Jibaro singers in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. There were female singers, Trovadoras and such as like La Calandria and, and a few others. Um, but as far as cuatrita, female cuatritas, it has, it has started to grow and it continues to grow today. And nowadays we have some of the world's finest female cuatritas that me personally, I do not dare to sit next to them and take my cuatro out of my case. I will sit next to some of these particular females and just absorb everything they have to offer because it's such a great influence. And I want it to continue to go in that direction. You know, um, there's powerful cuatrita, female cuatrita such as Maribel Delgado. Me personally, probably the best female cuatrita in existence today. Then you have cuatritas like Emma Colón Sayas. Sister of the great Edwin Colón Sayas, a living legend cuatro player. Um, then you have Fabiola Mendez, who was the first female in history to get a bachelor's degree on the cuatro in, at Berkeley, University of the College of Music. So, um, and there's so many other cuatritas. Thankfully, now in Puerto Rico, it is being offered as a curriculum in schools. Back in the day, for me, it was just looking for someone sitting down and learning. Now today, you can just go sign up and get a degree on this stuff. And it's mind-boggling, mind-blowing, but such uh, 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 an inspiration to know that. Um, and, I could, and I hope that it continues uh, to grow more female cuatritas because that will in turn influence young girls. It will give young girls something to look up to and see that they can take this instrument to another another uh, level also. Do you think that, that female cuatristas face any particular challenges due to their gender or are they generally accepted in the world? I feel that to a certain extent they still face challenges because it's just a historical fact, you know, women were always treated different. So even in modern times, they still might face, face some challenges and be compared to quote unquote better men cuatritas or, or what have you. But thank God and thank, you know, thank the Lord above for people, cuatritas uh, like the ones I just named who are breaking those barriers and, and proving that it has nothing to do with gender. It has everything to do with your passion and what you put into it and the dedication to prove what you get out of it. Um, and so uh, to a certain extent, yes, I, I'm more than certain that if I were to sit down with some of my, my, my female patrita friends, um, they would express to me some challenges they, that they may have faced um, as females. But, you know, actions speak louder than words. And what I'm seeing through these female cuatritas um, is really proving and showing that it's, it's breaking the mold, it's taking it to another level. And in the near future, I see this going, you know, global, global with younger female cuatritas really proving and, and really showing um, the ability that the cuatro has. You know, it, it's, it's, it's all a mental thing. When you sit down with an instrument and you create and you invent, it has nothing to do with what gender you are. It, it's just your passion and your understanding and this, you know, your, your mind being open to this instrument uh, and being led by, by your emotions to create. And I've heard some of the greatest music 
because of female cuadritas. Given what you just said, uh, can you state again at what age you began to play the cuatro? You first picked up the cuatro? I first saw it at 14 being played by Alba Medina. I was about to turn 15. It was near the end of the year. My birthday's in December. And I was about to turn 15 and I asked my father for a cuatro for my birthday. I can't, I can't express how that made my father feel, right? My father being such a cultured person. Um, did we know any cuatro makers in New Jersey? No, <laughs> or in the States. And we've been away from the island for so long, we really didn't know any, any luthiers or cuatro makers in Puerto Rico either. So on my 15th birthday, I'm sitting down watching TV and my father walks in the room with uh, a trash bag, a big old trash bag. And he pulls the trash bag out and there's a cuatro with a crack on it, on the, on the top. Um, he had bought it off the street from some guy for like $50. And to this very day, I have that cuadro. And it's my muse, it's my inspiration, and it's a constant reminder of so much more than just my father giving me a cuadro. It's a constant reminder of my responsibility to my culture and my tradition and, and our people. Um, and that's the cuadro that I used to learn, broken and cracked and all. And as I continue progressing, my father would say, okay, here's a better one. Okay, here's a better one. Okay, here's a better one. And so I was open to the world of luthiers and, and, and the craftsmanship of making cuatros, and I was able to do my own research uh, to then choose my own instrument and from whom I wanted it from. And then you get, you know, as you grow, you get better quality instruments. And since that time that you first picked up the cuatro, was there ever another time that you put it down and, says, and you said to yourself, um, I don't think I'm, I'm going to do this? Um, I'll be honest with you, uh, there's plenty of times I've gotten frustrated as a musician. Uh, in your mind, you set such high standards sometimes, and you, you, some, I'm my worst critic, I can't, I can't watch myself or hear myself play for some reason. Uh, I cannot. And so there was plenty of times I get frustrated because I just felt I wasn't maturing as a musician or I wasn't growing as a musician. And, um, uh, but quitting, no, I haven't gotten to that extent. They're, 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 my frustration has led me at some point to where I don't play the instrument for like two weeks, three weeks. But after a while, it's, it, becomes, it has become such a part of my soul, such a part of my spirit, such a part of my essence that it just calls to me. It, the craving overcomes me where I need to, to play. I need to hear it. I need to feel it in my hands and I need to do something with it. Uh, so, so no, I haven't gotten to the point that cuatro itself doesn't let me break from it. <laughs> and so, it, it, you know, from, from the other part of the room, I could hear it calling me and I could feel it in my heart. And I'm like, I, I need to hear a cuatro. I need to, I need to, so I'll sit down, and, you know, and, and wait for another inspiration to come, whether I'm creating a, a, a song or playing something, you know? Um, you, it's okay. You mentioned um, the cuatro being played worldwide in Japan and Europe. Uh, is it being played mostly by Puerto Rican musicians that have that are living in in those parts of the world, or is it also being picked up by people from other cultures? Yeah, it's actually being picked up by people of other cultures. Uh, there's a Japanese man in Japan who's obsessed with the cuatro, for example. The cuatro became really big in Japan. I mean, huge uh, through a cuadrita known as uh, Prodigio Claudio, Eligio Claudio, but he, he he was known as Prodigy Prodigio. Uh, because of his ability. He was one of Maso Rivera's students. And, and he began in the, in the 80s and 90s touring Japan and he became such a huge celebrity. He would show up to the airports and he'd be masses and masses with banners. I mean, you think, you know, uh, you two showed up at the airport or, or one of these big celebrities. That's how big it got in Japan and, and it started influence, influencing a, a lot of Japanese people. And nowadays, you could look, you could go on YouTube and see people in Germany, Germans playing, and, and all types of Europeans playing the cuatro. Um, yes, they have their style of playing. They, may, they might not be playing it exactly how we do in Puerto Rico, or how we, do, how, uh, how we traditionally do, um, but it's just so cool to see the influence in different cultures and different parts of the world that they're utilizing it. Um, some people use it to play as background for poetry. You know, and, and things like that as an example. But it's so cool to see that. You see different people from different parts of the world and different cultures taking up this little instrument that, that uh, you know, just came out of nowhere in the 1800s, in 19, early 1900s, uh, and just influenced so many cultures. 
And um, uh, do those people also learn some of the traditional music, or are they mostly using it to to improvise and make their own? Music? Um, I, I feel it's both. They do once they pick it up, they 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 obviously do their research on it. What is this instrument? Where is it from? What is it used for? And usually, when you do the research on this instrument. 99.9% of the time, you're going to you're gonna hear Hibano music. That's what it's mostly known for and it's traditionally used for. So you're going to come across a lot of these old guard legends and such and even the newer generations that play this instrument. And so they pick up some of that stuff, but then they use that and apply and adapt it to whatever their culture is or whatever they want to use it for. And I, I'm, I'm all for it. I mean, just to see it there is it, such a huge influence. It was even used in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie in part two. There's a scene where they're all singing in, in a little room or something. And there's a pirate sitting in the back holding a Puerto Rican cuatro, strum, <laughs> strumming the cuatro. I mean, if your mind isn't blown after that, I don't know what would. But that is so cool to see that stuff, you know. What do you see the future of the traditional music of, of Puerto Rico? What do you see for that traditional music? Do you see it continuing? On? Do you see it starting to kind of die out? No, the, the, our traditional folk music is, is timeless. You can hear a record from the 1940s, 1950s of our music and then put on something that was just recorded last year traditionally and it sounds exactly the same. Maybe the quality of sound might be different because of the equipment used. Now we go digital and such, but uh, as opposed to the old analog stuff. Um, but it's it's a it's timeless it identifies us as a people it identifies us as as a, as an island as a country as our culture i don't ever see that dying and as long as i'm alive it's going to stay alive um but i do see it continue to evolve in the past about year i personally have re been recording um a fusion of hibaro music with modern influences so you'll hear what we know as aguinaldos, which is traditional from the folk music of Puerto Rico, but you're going to hear an aguinaldo being sung with maybe a hip-hop beat or some type of techno beat in the background or something. The reason I do this is because since the music is sometimes labeled as old-fashioned, it's, it's, I found it a little bit challenging to continue to reach a younger generation, especially Puerto Rican, young Puerto Ricans like myself that grew up away from the island, away from our culture, away from our tradition, and completely saturated and surrounded by the cultures of this country. It's not so easy to reach the younger generation. You can show them some of the music, but eventually they go back to what they're used to, what they're familiar with. So I decided to start fusing uh, uh, the cuatro music, the traditional stuff with more modern st sounds uh, in order to show that it could be universal in order to show that it doesn't have to be kept in a box, it has no limit, it can be used for whatever you want it to. Your culture should always be a part of you no matter what you do in life. Um, and, and thankfully it's, it's been being received very well. I have been able to do a couple of performances live on stage with this new fusion and I've been getting great response from the younger generation. Now I'm starting to get approached like that sounded like Daddy Yankee or that sounded like this hip hop band I know or this house band I know or what have you. But what's that instrument? What were you singing? That sounded cool. That was different. Now I got my door open to say, well, listen, this is your instrument. This is from Puerto Rico where you're from. You like me were raised here, but we have our culture. We have our music. We have our instrument. Just in case you didn't know, I have met young Boricuas, young Puerto Rican men and women who had no clue, had no idea that we had a national instrument, had no clue what this instrument was. Um, and so it, thankfully I've been able to utilize this gateway to be able to reach those young Puerto Ricans. You talked about fusion and everything. Let's, let's go back to some of the traditional music of Puerto Rico, which is very ancestral and it's African based. Obviously in Puerto Rico, La Bomba en la Plena, Yes. Bomba more than plena. Plena is more modern, but bomba is ancestral. Uh, in reference to that, how, how do you see, and again, let me, let me retro here again, because you said you would like to see the cuatro at the forefront of a production. Not, not, not that the, the focus would be on a bomba drum, a primo, or a seguidor, or the si whatever. You want to see it at the forefront. How, how do you see that coming together with another traditional music, such as Bomba and Plena in Puerto Rico? Because, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that it's done. It's 
been done many times. How, how, what's your interpretation of that? Well, Bomba and Plena is, to me, is a superstar all on its own. We adopted this from our, you know, our African ancestors. It's something we cherish and adore in Puerto Rico, our Bomba and Plena. That is such a huge part of our DNA. It's not even funny. And the cuadro sometimes is used in Bomba and Plena for, you know, carrying melodies and such when they're singing. Traditionally, it doesn't require the cuadro, but, you know, the cuadro has become the national instrument. It's so huge that in a part of Puerto Rico that, that it is used for Bomba and Plena. Um, and so my, my goals or intentions to where I see the cuadro would never, it, it would never be to take that part out because Bomba and Plena cannot be compared to anything. You could play Bomba and Plena any part of this world, any part of this planet, and people will know there's some Puerto Ricans in the room. There, that's, that's Boricua, that's Puerto Rico. And that's something that we're so proud of. I love it. And so um, I want to see the, the Cuatro as a forefront, whether it be with Bomba and Plena, whether it be with the traditional Aguinaldos and Seis, um, I wanted to, to it, it, you know, in my time as a cuatro player, you don't have to question Bomba and Plena. I've had, I've never had any person tell me they don't know what that is. They might forget what it's called, but once they play it, oh, they know what that is. It's not the same for the cuatro, you know, um, and, and sometimes it's sad for me to meet a young, a young Puerto Rican man or woman and they don't know what the cuatro, they never heard of it. They never seen it before. They didn't know it was a national instrument. They can care less, to be honest with you, because they're not from over there. They don't see it the same, and blah blah blah. Whereas Bomba and Plena, there's no question about it. Once it comes on, you know exactly where that's from. And I would love to see the Cuatro get that big, that worldwide, that global. Not to take that out, not to bump out Bomba and Plena, because that's part of our DNA, such as the Cuatro is. But I just want to continue to. I want to see the Cuatro to continue. To grow as such and be just as influential uh, being that it's a national instrument and the reason I was questioning you on that is because again it comes to this idea of race I think there, there, there is that mentality sometimes in Puerto Rico Let, let's face it racism isn't dead in Puerto Rico correct now it, it has it has that aspect to it but in Puerto Rico, back in the 60s with Haciendo Punto, mm -hmm. with Moliendo Vidrio, those groups, it seems that the Cuatro had more of a calling to that type of music, La Nueva Trova. Correct. Um, and I just wonder if you, you could speak a little bit to the idea of possible racism impacting on, on that elevation of the Cuatro within that other genre of music that is in the DNA of Puerto Rico. Correct, and I believe that that racism is our limitation. One of the greatest, or not greatest, one of, well, yeah, one of the, the greatest ignorances that I've ever seen is racism. And, and I feel that humanity in itself limits itself because of racism. We have no clue, we have no idea and no clue how far humanity could have gotten in 2019 had racism never existed since the beginning of time. We could have been so far evolved and advanced and, um, as, as, a, as a species. But specifically with the musical culture of Puerto Rico, I feel that it has also obviously been limited. We could have probably been influencing a lot more than it is. And, you know, it's, it's sad to say that because of racism, um, music like Bomba and Plena has been limited. We cherish it, we love it um, to a certain extent. A lot of people don't want to accept it from where it, because of where it came from, from our African ancestors. Um, and that, I think, is such, it's so sad to hear, so sad to know, because uh, as a musician personally, I want to continue to grow doesn't matter to me what culture you're from or you know what country you're from what language you speak or gender or however you identify if it's no gender it doesn't matter it, it's not about that it's not the biological aspect of it or the your, your skin color physical aspect of it 
It's about your spirit, your essence, the mentality you have and what you have to offer this world. And to me, although I make my people proud uh, in Puerto Rico to be a musician, I'm trying to influence the world. I'm trying to influence languages. I'm trying to influence cultures all over the planet, not just my own little island. I want to make my little island proud that I'm influencing the world. And I want that for every musician, regardless of race. So let's change a little bit of the topic now. Not on the cuatro, but where, where the cuatro is going. You, you mentioned before, um, I believe it was uh, Nieves or Maso, the one who gave the free lessons? That was Maso Rivera. Maso Rivera, one of my favorite cuatristas. Do you see a need here in, in New Jersey for a school? Do you see yourself and at any point maybe starting a school to teach the cuatro? I never, I never thought myself of, of starting a school. I do give private lessons. Um, I'm not a great teacher. I'm horrible at teaching sometimes um, because I learned off the street, basically. I never learned a proper discipline and education to learn how to pass the teaching part of it down. But um, I feel that it's a necessity to pass down the traditions, the necessity to pass down our culture. And I let that push me and, 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 and charge me to want to be able to teach because I feel it's important. And, and that in itself is the necessity to pass on our traditions and our cultures as any other culture would. You know, so, so I just feel that that in itself is a necessity. Um, it's to that younger generations can learn about what it is. It's not necessarily that I need to teach someone how to play this song. It's not that. It's bigger. It's a bigger picture to me. And so to answer your question, yes, I feel like there, to a certain extent there is a necessity that there should be some type of school, whether I'm the one who starts it or any other cuatro player or any person that's, that's disciplined in music that I can do it. It doesn't have to be me. But I feel that necessity because there's, there's uh, you know, younger generations coming that need to know, um, Puerto Rican generation that need to know what the instrument is and, and really understand it, where it's coming from. Not just know a song or just be familiar with some of its melodies because they're the grandfathers or what have you, but really understand the culture behind it. I have one more question for you. We spoke a little while ago about Don Tuto Feliciano, uh, a gentleman who is a legend, as you said, told, you know, you explained to us. Uh, you never met him, according to what you said. Correct. Can you, can you give us a little idea of how he plays in your mind? In terms of that instrument you see there? Yeah, Tuto Feliciano, uh, unfortunately, is not mentioned a lot nowadays, and he should be. He deserves a lot of recognition. Tuto Feliciano is such a huge influence on, on Hibaro music. Uh, he was ahead of his time, I would say. You know, Tuto started at a very young age playing the traditional four string cuatro. He was one of the first in the world to start playing the eight string cuatro, which later became the ten string, which is the one I play. Um, and so, at, even at his time, at the early age, he was already multi-talented, playing the cuadro, playing the requinto, as we know, that is used for like uh, boleros in Puerto Rico, playing the, the tres, the Cuban tres, to be, to, to be able to play the song and the guaguanco and everything from Cuba. And, you know, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, in those early times of this music evolving, Tuto those ahead of his, of his time. Um, and that's someone that... Cuadritas, I always say, any young cuadrita that wants to learn, go back and look and do your research and, and listen to people like Tuto and, and Maso Rivera, who we spoke about. Um, two giants of, of, that, of the genre at that time. Tuto was able to record with a lot of known trovadores, recorded plenty of albums. Um, and a lot of his playing should be and is standards of what cuadritas should be listening to nowadays if you want to learn any any instrument any musician will tell you you want to learn how to play you know the trumpet go listen to miles davis you want to know how to play this go listen to so and so from the 1950s or whatever you know those are the that's the foundation so the same rules apply to this instrument we have our legends our old guard from the 1940s 50s 60s 70s uh, and tuto is one of the main uh, big ones of that time 
um, to be able to listen to a record and hear him play the cuatro, but then in, in this album or this song, he's, he's playing a guitar or a quinto, or in this album, he's playing a Cuban tres, and it's like, okay, but it's only 1950 something, like this is crazy. You know, um, it's, so, it's so influential to be able to listen to people like Tuto. And as part of that question, um, why, why do you believe that he is not as well known and, and he didn't get the recognition? Have you heard any, uh, let's call it bochinche, that's a good word for <laughs> yeah. it, out there in, in the world of cuatro playing. You have any thoughts on that? No, not really. I, uh, to be honest with you, I guess it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know if it's a fad thing where a, a person, you know, a, a society might get stuck or used to just listening to one specific or two specific cuatritas and then constantly use the same ones and then kind of leave out the other ones. It happens today. You have cuatritas where they kind of utilize the same ones all the time and therefore those are the ones that become popular. But there's a lot of other cuatritas that deserve recognition that maybe influence those popular cuatritas, you know what I'm trying to say? So um, m maybe, it was, maybe it was some of that going on at, at the time with, with Tuto. I mean, Tuto got his due respect from from musicians and stuff like that because musicians knew. There, there's cuatritas I know nowadays, they don't have a single video on YouTube, uh, you know, on any social media, things like that. But you sit down with, those are the senseis, you sit down with, sit down with them and you see their ability, it'll blow your mind. You're wondering how come this person isn't famous, you know, there's some musicians like that. Um, and it's the same thing with Tuto. Tuto was beyond his time multi-talented guy that influenced a lot of musicians and for what he did record he became popular he became well respected um but i can't really tell you why you know he didn't blow up maybe as such as Nieber Maso and and other things uh, i don't know if Duto limited himself to just the traditional stuff uh, you know Nieve Quintero for example started experimenting Nieve said thought to himself you know what i'm gonna get out of there just to heave out and experiment Yomotoro showed up to the recording studio, right? He was going to record an album with Willie Colon and for La Fania, and a salsa album. He was gonna, he was supposed to record the electric guitar. They wanted to do like a rock guitar thing in the background for the salsa music. Yomotoro shows up at the studio with his cuatro in his hand. Willie Colon looks at him and said, "What are you doing? We're not recording hibaro music. This is a salsa album." Yomotoro looked at him and said, "I'm a cuatrita. Take it or leave it." And the rest is history. You could not see that entire band, Celia Cruz La Fania, without Yomotoro in it. So it didn't matter then, you know? Um, and, and so those are great influences. And I feel like Tuto influenced people like Yomo, people like Maso, and, and Nia Quintero, and things like that, because his ability was ahead of his time. I got another question that yeah. came to mind. I, I know that you are in the Library of Congress. Correct. Can you, can you tell us how that happened to you? Um, came to be. That was one of the greatest honors of my life to perform at the Library of Congress. I was able to do it twice. Tw why twice? I don't know. That, that's a double blessing. But um, I, I received a phone call to come perform for uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, at the Library of Congress to, to bring a short program. Um, and we went and performed at the Library of Congress, uh, took an, a, a concert of our traditional Hibaro music, um, which was a great privilege. The following year, uh, I got a call back from the Library of Congress wanting us to come do an entire concert, but not only a concert, uh, they wanted to conduct an oral history interview on, on me for the, the archives at the Library of Congress. And I can tell you the fear that struck in my heart and the only thing that came to my mind was what what am i going to be able to say and do to make every cuatro player look and sound good because i felt such weight on my shoulders like there's nothing i can say or do to really represent all these amazing cuatro players that exist nowadays and the legends of the past and that's the kind of weight i put on my shoulders this is why i'm my worst critic um but we were able to go back the following year uh, and perform at the Library of Congress, take a full concert. Um, and it was my understanding I was one of the, not the first, but one of the first, because it's only a handful of cuatritas that, that were able to do it, but one of the first uh, cuatrita solo was to be able to take a concert uh, to the Library of Congress and the Kennedy Center. I was the second cuatrita in history to take a concert 
uh, as a soloist at the Kennedy Center. The first Cuatrita was just a year before me, I think was uh, a year before, was uh, Edwin Colón Sayas. Uh, and he's a living legend. So he was the first person, and I, I, as my understanding, I was the, from what I was told, I was the second person in history to do that, which is such a humbling honor. Um, and we were also, as I said, able to do the oral history interview, which was uh, inducted into the Library of Congress archives as part of American History Forever. And the one thing that came to my mind and comes to my mind all the time is I have a daughter, I have a 15 year old daughter, my only child. And it just is so humbling to know that years and years and years down the line when I'm long gone, my daughter can go to the Library of Congress archives and see this interview and see her dad. And, and, I, and I can say, hey, I have some type of legacy to pass down to a younger generation. It might not be uh, that I, I pass down the music per se as a student that learned, but I have that to give to my, my, my daughter. And, and that's such a humbling thought to even think of that. And it's something that I will, one of my greatest accomplishments, something that I will take with me to the day I die, is being able to perform at the Library of Congress and have that uh, oral history interview conducted. Can you, can you play some, show us some, some examples of some of the different styles maybe? Absolutely, absolutely. Do you mind? I'll try my best. So, um, speaking on on uh, you know uh, influences and, and styles, um, we have um, the aguinaldos, right? That are traditional from Puerto Rico. So we'll have, for example, this one's called the aguinaldo costanero, which goes. We talk about Maso Rivera, who is like the, to me, one of the purest essence of Hibaro music. While the trovador will be singing, Maso wouldn't be really doing all this fancy stuff. Maso will be in the background just going. straight to the point you know and I love to listen to Maso because of that influence uh, it's one of my go-to guys to listen to to really capture the essence of our folk and traditional music uh, of Puerto Rico um, then you have for example uh, Segundesima, very popular in Puerto Rico for the, you know, uh, for the trovador to sing to and improvise. They usually use uh, the decima and the seis fajardeño, which comes from fajardo. This is another thing. In Puerto Rico, almost every town has its, its aguinaldo or its seis. The seis fajardeño comes from the pueblo of the town of Fajardo, right? And it's one of the most popular ones that go... Says from Fajardo. Then you go over to Comerio, the town of Comerio, and they have their says. That's that's the says from Comerio, for example. Um, and so you go to Orocovis, and Orocovis got an aguinaldo that they made world famous, and known as the aguinaldo orocoveño, right? And it goes. It's, it's so awesome to see that, you know, in every town, in every, any village, any pueblo in Puerto Rico, you have a cuatrita that, uh, you know, can influence the cuatro and the future of the cuatro. And this is music that's existed since the 1800s, you know, that's still, that's still our staple today and our, front, our, our foundation as, as cuatro players 
um, for our music. You go over to Caguas in Puerto Rico, and Caguas has its own aguinaldo that Ramito made famous in, in, you know, in the 50s and 60s, and everybody knows this melody. <laughs> Caguas, you know, and it's it's so crazy that that we listen to this music today, and a lot of people don't know, uh, you know. As a cuatrita, personally, uh, I always felt it was impor important to to not just play the melodies, but know where they came from and why, and, and maybe even try to find out who created them. Maso Rivera invented what's known as the quinto al aire, and it's it, you know, me personally. Since he invented it, it's from, from, it should be from his town. But he named it the Quinta Laire because the fifth string, right? One, two, three, four, five. The fifth string is played open. So it's the, the la Quinta Cuerda, the fifth string. Al aire, it's open. So he invented this Quinto Al aire, Right? One of the most biggest aguinaldos today. It's so beautiful, and to think that this was invented in the 50s, you know, 40s by Maso Rivera, this little guy from the mountains, you know, in Puerto Rico, and I'm sure he had no clue, no idea the kind of influence it would make on cuatritas and musicians even now in 2019, and even after his passing, it'll continue because of the influence these people have on us cuatro players.